Um, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to be here at Reboot Develop Blue. Um, our session today is called Some Seriously Explicit Lessons in Vulcan. My name is Alon Back. I'm from Samsung Electronics and I'm here with Carl Miege from Crow Team. We're going to be talking about our journey to create um, more efficient pipelines in Vulcan uh, and the experiences we've learned along the way. So a quick bit um, about um, my team. I'm in the Samsung Galaxy Game Dev team. We support game studios across the world, both remotely um, in our offices and on the site. Uh, we um, primarily, a lot of our time is spent promoting the use of Vulkan on Android, um, and we will be explaining why in this session. And we help our partners optimize their game titles through the use of best practices, and that's what we're very keen to share here today, um, and we do in, in other conferences as well. And these are some of the titles that we've been working on recently, which I hope you're familiar with. We're quite a friendly bunch. Um, uh, so despite all those photos, there's only around 30 of us across the world. We are very busy. Um, I could try and list all 30 of us and thank every single team member, um, but I want to in particular thank Michael Park and White, um, who put together uh, the, the material for this slide deck um, and presented it. Um, and that, that, uh, he's done, done a lot of the work alongside myself with Crow Team. So today's session, we'll be talking about the lessons um, that we gained in Samsung um, from, from our work in Cirrus Engine, as well as the plans that Crow Team has with Cirrus Engine. We've been actively working together with Crow Team um, on porting Cirrus onto Android and optimizing it to get the best performance. And that's one of the key things. We use Vulkan to get the best possible results on Android. Uh, a key thing of how our team works is we're very evidence-based. Uh, we use a variety of tools to profile game titles when we get access to them, um, including uh, the ones listed here um, on, on your screen. Uh, Samsung Galaxy flagship devices uh, use two uh, chipsets, depending on which market they're sold in. Uh, you can either be based on the Samsung Exynos SoC with Mali GPUs, or the Qualcomm Snapdragon SoC with Adreno GPUs. And depending on which one of these you're profiling for, you should use different tools. And today I'll be talking about our experience using Streamline. So Streamline it, it comes from ARM. Um, it provides CPU information for both chipset variants, but, but importantly, it provides GPU data for our Mali-based devices. And it takes a capture, like the one here, um, of CPU, driver, and hardware performance counters into a trace. And this gives us a really good starting point uh, when profiling, figuring out how the workload is being executed. So in this trace here, we've picked a couple of key activity counters. Um, in this slightly shaded area, you'll see that's one frame that we've got, so a full, a full frame being rendered. And you'll see that the second row in orange is the vertex activity uh, um, in the second row. And the third row is the fragment activity. Now, you'll notice they're almost completely interleaving. And this is an example of poor pipelining. We call it pipeline bubbles. And these gaps in the workload um, are an issue for us. Because despite most mobile GPUs now being unified core architectures, they still really benefit by having a saturated workload, which enables efficient job scheduling and use of specific units. So we really want to make sure the GPU is steadily fed work. But because of, because of this, our frame cost is a, a mega uh, whopping 62.5 millisecond at our first capture, resulting in running at only 16 frames per, per second. So um, in Vulkan, we use various synchronization primitives to coordinate the rendering work. The driver cannot uh, make any assumptions on the dependencies. It's up to the app, up to the engine, to define them explicitly. And if you contrast this with OpenGLES, where the driver has to figure out if dependencies exist and heuristically determines which stages can or cannot be overlapped, sometimes manages to get efficiencies, sometimes doesn't. 
a pipeline barrier um, creates an extension dependency, um, sorry, execution dependency between two pipeline stages. The destination stage is blocked until the source stage completes. Now, Sirius Engine uses pipeline barriers to synchronize, but you could also use subpass dependencies to achieve this. I'm not going to go into that detail. I refer you to one of Tobias Hector's many talks uh, about keeping the GPU fed if you are interested. So let's take this example. So this is not from Sirius Engine. Uh, we've got an example here with two passes, a shadow pass and a main pass. And the, the main pass uh, has a dependency on the shadow map coming out of the shadow pass. So we know we need to have some sort of execution dependency between these two passes. So a naive way to achieve this would be to put a pipeline barrier that blocks the top of pipe of the main scene until the bottom of pipe of the shadow pass is completed. That guarantees that all work on the main scene is held until the shadow pass completes. That, however, results in a total execution time of 28 milliseconds, and we can do better than this. So these are the two passes, the shadow and the main pass. We know, however, that the app only needs the result from the shadow map for the fragment shading in the main scene. So there's no need to block the main scene's vertex work, and we have therefore got an opportunity for the main scene's vertex work to occur in parallel with the shadow pass being executed, resulting in far better utilization of the GPU. So how do we achieve this? We set a pipeline barrier with a destination stage of the fragment shader, and then we hook it up to the source stage of the color, color output of the shadow pass. And that, we know, is the work that is actually required, the data that's actually required um, for the main um, render pass to, to, be, um, to result in correct behavior. So what this means is that the, the bits highlighted in lilac-y purple can, run, can be executed at the same time. They're not blocked on each other. So let's see what this results in. You'll see that the main scene's vertex pass, which takes six milliseconds, is now able to execute immediately after um, the shadow pass vertex work is done. It could even happen at the same time. That just happens to be how we ended up seeing the results uh, when profiling. And this means that there's a potential um, six millisecond speed up uh, in execution time because that work is happening in parallel. So going back to Sirius Engine, this is the trace we showed earlier. Applying the, the same optimization in Sirius Engine, we see a, quite a dramatic improvement you'll notice that the vertex activity is a lot more saturated. There's far fewer pipeline bubbles occurring. Now, the, the mobile architectures we deal with, especially the ARM architecture, simultaneous arithmetic um, texture and load store work is um, highly desirable. Vertex work uh, is most often ALU bound, uh, and fragment work is most often texture bound, and, and you can benefit by having these occur at the same time resulting in a more power-efficient um, use of the game. In our, our scene here in Sirius Engine, we got a, a dramatic increase of 56%, um, of a 22.5 millisecond drop in execution time. But let me explain why we were able to do this. So Sirius Engine is a quality AAA engine, and I promise you I'm not just saying that because um, I'm on the Crow Team sponsored stage, and there's an army of Crow Team engineers glaring at me. Uh, it is a really high quality engine. However, um, it is designed to be a, a console desktop engine, and it, it is performance tuned for console and desktop GPUs. And that can result in poor performance on mobile. And one common example we see um, in Sirius uh, Engine um, is a large amount of vertex work which is being executed. And that's actually something we see very often across console engines, because vertex work is not as expensive on console and desktop as it is on mobile. On mobile, it is kind of our nightmare to have a ton of vertex work happening. So what we can see here highlighted um, in both the vertex and the, and the fragment work is the, how much load the depth prepass is taking. 
So for, for mobile tilers, a, a lot of the benefit that the depth prepass provides is actually a burden. Uh, the, the tiler is already going through the geometry, uh, and doing a separate depth prepass is actually additional work, whereas it's an optimization um, on immediate renderers. So what, what um, Michael did in his experiment was looking what would happen if the depth prepass was removed. Now, big, big disclaimer caveat, if you just remove this, you lose a bunch of effects. Um, so Depth-based effects like fog um, would have to be turned off. However, we, we are looking at to see, can these be done in more efficient ways for mobile? So having a separate subpass just for these effects, um, as, as opposed to taking the full hit on the depth prepass. Similarly, occlusion queries do take up a big chunk of um, vertex work, and that's something we're looking at, um, whether there's other ways to achieve the results, the resulted effects they provide. So based on the work we did with Sirius Engine um, and the, the scalable shader system that Crow team developed, we've been experimenting to come up with a, with a good model for handling the large numbers of shaders efficiently. Uh, another disclaimer, as Carlo will soon uh, explain, this is still very much a prototype that we're evaluating. So AAA games typically have thousands of unique materials, lots of dynamic object updates. GPU memory management can be rather tricky, uh, as we are now learning in Vulkan. So after giving that responsibility to the game engine, it isn't a simple problem to solve. The goal we're looking at uh, here is to create a blueprint tailored for Vulkan that would handle such a shader system and deal with all the large numbers of shaders to, and try and provide a simple design for easily updating uniforms universally, no matter which shader is used, and minimize descriptor set updates. We also want to try and achieve a small number of rebinds uh, between draws. And finally, we really, really want to avoid um, dynamic memory allocation mid-frame, because that's an expensive operation, and suddenly you'll, your game will stall and jitter, and we do not like that. So the, the solution we've come up with, uh, shaders need to access live uniform data, like object transforms, camera properties, material attributes, etc., Rather than creating a new VK buffer every time we need to modify this data, we allocate a large buffer per shader stage up front, and then that maps, um, that, that maps to what the app is using, and the app is responsible for managing it. The uniform data uh, gets stored within this buffer, like, like above there. And once we've reached the bottom of the buffer, we go back to the top, we wrap around, um, and um, override data no longer used um, by the scene. And we found anecdotally from all our evidence that one buffer per shader stage is a good sweet spot because it, it minimizes the amount um, of unique pieces of data that we have to update because vertex data tends to contain a lot of repeated information, such as scene properties, um, and then that can be reused uh, by different shaders or objects. Um, a benefit of mobile is uh, mobile memory is unified. You have a unified memory architecture. So you can map, the, the, you can create the VK buffer using mappable memory and then map it and have, blat it from the CPU without having a copy because it's the same actual memory. On desktop, however, you can't do this. Uh, you need to create a um, uh, staging buffer, so having a separate copy, and then you use a command called vkcmd copy buffer to incrementally update from the one that your host owns to the ones of your device. Uh, however, there's, there's benefits because desktop GPUs tend to have a transfer queue that can deal with that very efficiently. Um, so that's a plus there. But that's, you can ignore that because that's desktop and desktop doesn't matter. Um, that's a joke. <laughs> um, so, um, when writing out uni this, um, the uniforms to this buffer, we keep track of the offset, so where, where, where the data has been put, and we use that when we bind the descriptor sets in the command buffer. So, how does the mapping work in the shader? Uh, 
if you can see here, this is a very simple bit of shader code, so um, shader.vert. Um, and this is the rand robin buffer for vertex work that I mentioned earlier. So based on the uniform data that the shader requires, we create a set of descriptor set layout bindings. And these descriptor set layouts are used to describe the structure of the shader and what uniform buffer objects it's expecting. And we set the type to be dynamic as it will be dynamically updating these descriptors. For each of these layouts, we need to allocate uh, a descriptor set. And that comes from a descriptor pool. And that memory for the descriptor pool was allocated before we got to our frame loop. So away, again, expensive operation. You do that away from your frame loop. Um, then we need to update each descriptor to point to our round robin buffer. And we're ready to get, go ahead and use our vertex shader bindings. Similar for the fragment shader, just a different set of bindings for the different uniforms it requires. So now we get to a nice, beautiful visual example of this. Um, what, what, um, what, how would this actually impact a scene? Um, and just to be absolutely clear, uh, this is not a scene from Sirius Sam 4. Um, I was asked to say that by the artists. Uh, in this scene, we have four independent objects and two material types. So, first we update the uniforms, which is accomplished by writing out data to one of our desired buffers. So you'll see here that the, the scene properties and camera properties appear in the fragment and vertex uniform buffers um, accordingly. We repeat that and then we um, bind our opaque material pipeline. So that's our bind there. So that binds it to a, a VK pipeline which contains the shader um, that we've compiled. So next, we, we, um, we need some more uniform datas, data to write out from the material and for our house. And we bind that. And when we, when we bind that, so if you see, that's the, the point where the shader knows where in memory to pick up its uniforms from. And then um, our command buffer, after doing that bind, gets to execute, and we have our house on our frame buffer. So next up, we draw the terrain. Um, so again, we're updating uh, materials, uh, updating uniform data here for the material. But because this object is using the same material as our previous one, we don't need to update the scene or camera properties again. That's still there from the previous um, render. We only have to provide offsets that are different like this one. And that reduces the work both for our application and for the driver. So it reduces having to compute new offsets, rebind uniforms, et cetera. And note that we've um, chosen this specific draw order because, because both uh, ma materials are opaque, um, then it reduces the need for rendering the beautiful terrain that we got behind it. And finally, we draw our trees. We're now having to switch to a new pipeline uh, because this is a transparent material pipeline uh, for the leaves. Um, any descriptor sets that have been previously bound with the previous VK pipeline, um, if they match, they remain bound. If they don't match the layout, they become unbound. And in our case, we have to rebind most of our uniforms. So we update our objects, we bind them, we draw a tree, we update the, the, the uniforms again, we rebind them, and we draw our second tree. And one more uh, uh, comment here that um, I do seriously hope that uh, any Crow team artists t um, with us today appreciate the photorealism of these grass blades. Uh, I know how much you care about your grass blades. So, um, sampler uniforms are a little bit different. Um, and this, a couple of caveats. We, we don't have a mechanism in core Vulkan at the moment to dynamically update uh, in a command buffer until we get to bindless descriptor indexing, and that's 
that's kind of, there's currently a multi-vendor extension to do that, uh, um, but current hardware does not um, universally support that. So we need to pre-bake descriptor sets for any combination of textures or samplers that we want to use. We allocate a descriptor pool to store our bindings. Um, and then uh, we do that again early on. We don't want the descriptor pool um, memory allocation to create a hitch in our frame loop. Then whenever we encounter an, an object that uses a texture sampler, first we create a descriptor set layout. And this is just like what we did before with our other uniform data. And uh, in this case, we've got um, the, the three sampler bindings uh, for, for texture, diffuse, texture normal, and texture specular. Um, however, if we, we'll get to this when we get, uh, get to the bottom. If you've already created this earlier, you don't have to again. Next, we create the descriptor set from the pool. And if, if, if we found it because um, the, it's already in there with a hash we're about to create, let me just put these full up. Full up. Um, if it's already there because of a hash, we don't have to do that again. Thirdly, we update the sample bindings to point to the specific image resource we need. Uh, in this case, we're drawing a hedgehog onto the scene to update the descriptors uh, with a descriptor image info structure that points to those images that would have been created earlier. And finally, you bind um, this all together, um, binding the descriptor set. When you compare this with OpenGLES, this process has to happen every draw call. Um, there's no way to tell the driver whether or not your sampler is changing or not. And that overhead is what Vulkan really reduces. Uh, one last note. Um, when you, when you hit your descriptor pool limit, when you've maxed out your memory, you've created too many um, descriptor sets, uh, then it is far more beneficial uh, to reset your descriptor pool uh, and recreate those than allocating a new one on the fly, again, to reduce, uh, to reduce the need for dynamic allocation of memory um, uh, when you're doing expensive rendering. So on that note, I'm gonna, it's my pleasure to hand over to Carlo who will be talking about what's in the pipeline for Sirius Engine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sit now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, does this work? Yeah. So yeah, uh, my name is Carlo Yesh. Uh, I've, um, uh, I'm an engine programmer at Crow Team, and recently uh, we've been working on pipeline creation in Sirius Engine, and this is what I'm going to be talking to you about. So uh, what's the problem? So pipeline creation is slow. We've known that it was slow back on OpenGL, but with that API, there was nothing uh, we could do about it. Same goes for the older versions of DirectX. Uh, but with, uh, this all changed with uh, modern APIs like Vulkan. Um, so one of the things that Vulkan has is the VK pipeline cache. Uh, which caches the already created pipelines. But this will not help with the first impression uh, because the first time that you load the game, it will stutter. First time you open a level, it will stutter. New scene, stutter again. So a lot of stuttering, basically, uh, and especially on some platforms. Uh, so our solution for this was to move pipeline creation from uh, render time to load time when the game or level is loading. So the point from where we started was our old uh, graphics API, which was made years ago before the modern uh, APIs like Vulkan. And uh, there, the pipelines could only exist in the low-level graphics code. Uh, and um, it was done so that uh, various inputs and state setting functions uh, would be called all over the code. And when you issued a draw call, uh, we would actually combine all those inputs, calculate a hash, 
and uh, then see if that pipeline state maybe already exists. If it does, then we use it. If not, we create it. And this is the process that we need to need to do every every draw call. Uh, but the problem here is that since uh, the state depends on so many external variables, it, there's no way of knowing which pipeline you're going to use until you actually issue that draw call. Um, so this became a huge problem when we started working on Telesport uh, for Xbox One on DirectX 12 and later for the Nintendo Switch with Vulkan, where pipeline creation was very, very slow. Uh, but fortunately, since those are consoles and have fixed hardware, we could actually ship the pipelines themselves, the caches, with the game. So what we did is that we created a sort of a renderer that actually uh, rendered all the objects in the game as they were loading. So every model, every uh, decal, every particle effect was rendered under various conditions. So all the possible combinations of lights and everything. And that gave us our, our pipeline caches and it was good. The games worked quite well, but the the problem was that we couldn't still be 100% sure that we've covered all possible cases. So, and that's because uh, the, the pipelines that we use were the result of the states that we set externally instead of having the state be the result of the set pipeline as it is in modern APIs. So, uh, this experiment led us to the design of the new system. Uh, in the new system, uh, pipelines are first-class citizens. They can be created by the high-level code using generalized API agnostic descriptors. And uh, they can even be, uh, after they're created, they can be for some more simple uh, effects like a GUI or HUD rendering. They can be bound directly and used for, 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 for drawing. But more generally, for more complex objects like models, uh, they are organized in hierarchical uh, state caches that are created when these uh, uh, resources are loaded. So uh, what we've noticed then, known before, is that uh, a lot of parts of the pipeline state are constant uh, and do not change when, uh, uh, for example, any particular model is being rendered. But uh, there are, on the other hand, lots of other parts of the state that changes depending on the circumstances, various lighting conditions, etc. And for each such different circumstance, we need to create new variations. Yeah, and there are a lot of these variations, and uh, controlling their number and uh, reducing them to, to a lowest possible number is going to be a huge effort uh, uh, with this. Uh, it was, and it will be going forward. Uh, one other important feature that we wanted to have is that uh, we didn't want this... Uh, uh, the work on this to slow our designers down, because... Uh, uh, loading pipeline states would severely possibly increase loading times, especially now since we have too many states still. Uh, so what we did is we have delayed creation where the caches are actually created, but the pipeline states are only created as needed. So uh, let me show you like a simple example of, um, of, a, of, a, of a one pipeline cache. So it's... Um, uh, let's say we start with a model. Each model has a number of surfaces. Each surface defines a set of possible vertex inputs and has a material. Each material has one or more shader passes. Each of those shader passes then further defines the state. Uh, and for those parts of the state that remain undefined, we need to create more variations, of course. Uh, so, for example, let's say that we have a model that has... Uh, a double-sided surface, so both the front-facing and back-facing uh, polygons are rendered. In that case, we don't need additional variations for polygon um, uh, culling, but if we have our regular model where the back faces are culled, we need another variation where the front faces are culled because it might possibly be flipped or rendered in a mirror. Um, one other thing about the hierarchy design is that um, if any part of the hierarchy is modified, for example, say in the editor, uh, we can easily invalidate the entire cache. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, we knew from the start that this entire system was not going to be built and finished overnight. 
So um, we knew that both the old system and the new one will have to exist uh, side by side for quite a long time. Um, there's um, another interesting thing for us at Crow Team is that we uh, try and support uh, all our older content and try to make it work with the newer versions of the engine. Uh, but what this means is that we have a lot more content to support. So what we did with this system is that we decided to implement this for our uh, newly made um, uh, node-based uh, PBR shader that we designed for SAM4. And this one uses the new system. But all the older shaders uh, for the older games uh, still use the old system. So we need to, to work with that until everything is ported over. Uh, another important fact was that um, designing such a system will cause problems, uh, visual issues, and we wanted to minimize that as much as possible. So one of the ways um, that we did that was uh, the on-demand pipelines. Um, they are actually created from the bound inputs and like parts of the states from the cache, but mostly from the bound inputs. And some, in some way, they are a hybrid of the old and the new system. And what we're using them for is two things, uh, which are related for, uh, as a fallback and for validation. So what's going on is that, for example, if an artist is working on something and uh, uh, the pre-created state is wrong because someone made an error, let's say me, uh, and uh, when they're, um, they, uh, they will not see the problem, most likely, because the fallback would be used uh, instead, of the, instead of the provided state because the validation, the, the engine's validation system would detect, oh, this is not right, there's something wrong there. And, uh, but at, at the same time, this issue would be logged so that we know that there was a discrepancy even though it's not visible. Uh, and this logging was really an important part of the work because um, compared to visual regression testing for any kind of problems and differences, it's, it's much superior. So visual regression testing is very hard uh, and prone to errors because you need to look at the differences. And with pipeline states, they might sometimes be very subtle visual differences uh, between, for example, if, our, if a wrong shader was chosen. Sometimes it's glaringly obvious, but sometimes it's not. Um, one other part is that we try to reduce the um, duplic duplicate code paths that uh, result from having both systems as much as possible, but it's not always possible. So, for example, for decal rendering, uh, we apply a small depth offset, so there's no Z fighting. Um, but since depth offset is part of the pipeline state, it needs to be set when the states, states are created say, when we're using the new system. But if we're using the old system, then we need to have it set during rendering. Uh, so our solution for now, until we get rid of the old system, is to actually do both. So we set it both during pipeline creation and during rendering, and use our internal validation to check that everything matches. Uh, yeah, so like I said, um, the main problem is fighting with the variations. Uh, when we were doing the, the original Xbox One port, we found a lot of variations where we did and didn't expect. So it all depends on the flexibility of the rendering system. The more flexible it is, the more potentially, more potential for more pipeline states you have. and. Uh, uh, some systems, unfortunately, need to be flexible. So, for example, our decals can be put over any kinds of surfaces because we make shooter games and you put bullet holes on anything, and you need to be able to put bullet holes on anything. So these models could be animated or not. They can have light maps or not. And since the system needs to remain flexible, we say, well, the hell with it, we need more states, and we actually made them for decals. But on the other hand, we had like an interesting system where you could actually apply um, any kind of, it's a, it was like a material override overlay system, uh, which could apply any kind of material in the game over any model in the game, and it was 
control dynamically through scripting. Well, this gave a lot of power to, to, the, to the designers to do many interesting possible visual effects, but the problem is there's no way of knowing at uh, model loading time which materials we're going to end up with. Uh, so. Uh, what we did was um, it changed it so that uh, the materials that are going to be used as an overlay or override need to be stated explicitly in the model itself. So like this is a very, very, very small example. So for ex uh, we have uh, models and materials and if we only use the ones that are explicitly marked, we lose a lot of the states that we don't have to create in that case. So yeah, like I said, it's a balance. Uh, so, where we are at currently and what are we still need to do? Um, so, yeah, like I said <laughs> many times, reducing the number of states. And also, uh, when working uh, on new visual features, we now have to think about, always think about pipelines as well. If I'm, I have a cool new feature, will that add another variation or something? Then it's probably a no-go, unless it's very, very important. So. We need to think about that. Of course, we'll continue removing the, the older code paths, but it will take a while. And also, um, we could use this caching system for much more than pipelines. Uh, so we can go one step further than what Alan mentioned, and we could actually create descriptor sets uh, at load time. And we could also record secondary command buffers to they could, so when the model is being rendered, the, only the buffer is replayed instead of calculating the entire state all over again. But uh, that's, it's a still a long road ahead of us, and we'll see where it think, takes us. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, sorry, I've turned this oh, off. I can't figure out how to do it again. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, you have like um, extra slide with yeah. info. Yeah, do, if you have any questions, um, I'm guessing you're all saving them up for um, these fantastic other sessions we still have. Um, very excited by the next session coming up um, by Johannes Kuhlmann. Uh, it'll be the first session about Vulcan on the Nintendo Switch. That, or at, least the, that is, at least the first public session, which is going to be very exciting in this room after the break. And then tomorrow, uh, that's your chance to ask any questions you fancy. Uh, that's going to be with myself, Carlo, Graham, Weirdall, um, and Christian from Arm. Uh, this will be hopefully a very lively session uh, about the benefits and the challenges of GPU API standardization. Uh, do come along tomorrow morning. And a session um, from Arm about Arm Mobile Studio, which contains the tools we, um, I discussed today, including Streamline, and from Imagination, again, more, more good experience about profiling with mobile graphics applications. So do come along to these sessions, and feel free to ask questions after as well. Thank you.